We are going to continue our series through the book of Proverbs. So if you have a Bible with you, you can crack it open pretty much to the middle. We're in Proverbs chapter 16 to start. And this will be our second to last sermon in our Proverbs series, which is sad for a lot of reasons. One is because this has been a great time of just studying God's word to receive wisdom we can apply to our lives. It's also an indicator that the summer months are winding down and we're getting ready to send our kids back to school and transition into the fall and then eventually the death of winter. So lots of things to be sad about. But um, we are going to uh, look at one final, before we, we close everything next week, we're going to look at one final category of relationship this morning. Um, if you've noticed, if you've been with us through the summer studying the Proverbs, our, our, our series title, or really the theme that we've been studying is instructions for our life. That's what the Proverbs are. This is how God designed us to live, and when we uh, apply it to our life, it instructs us to live well. And if you're like me, you've noticed that in doing this, most of the categories that we're being instructed in have everything to do with relationships in our life. Most of your life that needs wisdom and, and instruction and knowledge and understanding, your most desperate times for wisdom are with people, typically. And that's why so much of the book of Proverbs has been a case study in how to do well with the relationships that God's given us. And so week by week, we've been looking at these different categories of re relationships. We started with our relationship with God. The beginning of wisdom is to fear God. And then it turned into the way that we have friendships and the, the wisdom that is necessary for that uh, God-given gift of a relationship. We talked about family and wisdom for the tension and, and, the, and the way that God can bless us through our families. We talked about marriage, husbands and wives. We need wisdom. Amen. Uh, last week, we talked about just the wisdom that is given to us by God's word for how to instruct our children in parenting. We even did wisdom for self-control. How do we use wisdom so that our life doesn't go off the rails and we actually can put it under the guidance of God's perfect will? And yet, with all of those categories covered, we still have one that we have to look at because the Proverbs won't let us off the hook. It is instruction for all of our life. And now we come to the final relationship category, and it is the one that we wish wasn't uncovered in the Proverbs. So as you think about everything I named, can you think of one that wasn't on that list in your survey of relationships? It is the one that, that is the hardest to say, okay, God, we want your instruction to direct us. It's actually the, the relationship category we probably want the least instruction for. And it is, of course, wisdom for the relationships that we have with enemies. The Bible does not let us off the hook, even with our enemies. And so we're going to start in Proverbs chapter 16, but before we do, uh, I realize that as we go through this, this will be a, a, um, a sermon that you probably won't love to hear. <laughs> this will not be a popular sermon, um, because I think these are Proverbs that we often don't want to apply. But to give a, a picture of maybe how our, our instinct is not to live out God's wisdom for our enemies, I want to... Uh, refresh your memory, maybe introduce you to the first time for one of the most beloved film characters in all of cinema. His name is Inigo Montoya. <laughs> you remember this man? If you've seen The Princess Bride, you know who I'm talking about. If you haven't seen it, please go watch it. It's got a, got a lot of good lessons in it. But he is a case study in how we actually feel about enemies. He is a man that introduces himself to the main character as a man that is living his entire existence. His whole life is now to avenge the death of his father. And so we start with a quote from the famous Inigo Montoya when he says, I have dedicated my life to the study of fencing for the last 20 years so that the next time I meet the six-fingered man, I will not fail. I will go up to this man and say, hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father, prepare to die. And he's a beloved character. <laughs> he's a beloved character for both Christians and non. But as a believer and a follower of the way of Jesus, we should listen to this man's vindictive heart and say, repent, brother. 
That is not wisdom that you are living your life by. But what do we do? I can't wait till he meets the six-figure man. I can't wait till he goes up there and slashes his cheek and teaches him that, it, that there is death to be paid for death. That is a character we love because that character lives inside every single one of us. And when we come to God's word and say, instruct our lives, it only works if we're willing for every category to be covered. So uh, we, we receive wisdom, not just for the relationships that we want to thrive on the vine, but also the relationships that sometimes we want to forget. And so this morning, we look at essentially a playbook for peacemakers. And we'll start in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7. The Proverbs are full of wisdom on how to make and keep and cultivate peace in relationships. And here's how we start. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And this has been a hold steady truth for our journey through Proverbs, that one of the principles to live by is if you really trust God with your whole life, he will take care of all of the details. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. He will direct your steps. And if you do that and your ways are pleasing to him, he'll even take care of your enemies. I love the word even your enemies, which means a playbook for peacemaking will include the most difficult and hardened and least likely people to ever come back around in your life. But it's also something that we have to do all of the time in the categories we've already studied. There is peacemaking and relationship repair that you need to have as husband and wife and neighbor and friend and family and parent and child because the wisdom given to us by the Proverbs is an ideal and it's applied into the real world. None of the sermons that we've preached can be applied perfectly, and all of them must be applied with a healthy view of necessary repair all throughout the application. And this one starts by saying, if you commit your life to God and your ways honor him, your enemies are on the table for his repair. He will take care of even your enemies. So what we're going to look at is essentially how those ways can be so honoring that we find peace. So if you're a sermon title uh, note taker, the, the essential view of this sermon will be three practices for peacemaking. Three ways that the Proverbs will give us some of the direction on our ways to honor God so that even our enemies could be at peace with us. And as we look at part one, we have to look no further than what we already read in Proverbs chapter 16. The, the proverb is focusing on your way. Not the enemy's ways. This is a very difficult lesson to learn and be refreshed by over and over and over again. But as we start to live out the Proverbs in our life, it is going to be a responsibility to you, for you to focus on how God is working them out in you more than other people. In Proverbs chapter 11, it gives us a, a, an easier way to sink our teeth into this truth. It says, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 12 he who is devoid of wisdom, and you've got no view of wisdom for the people in your life, you will despise your neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his peace. So the alternative to focusing on your ways is to begin to despise other people. And a sermon that has everything to do with peacemaking and reconciliation is an applicable sermon for our times because we live in one of the most divided times, or maybe it's just par for the course for all of humanity, but it seems as though that the division that we all sense is a problem that is growing. And we can sense it in all of the ways that we interact with the real world. Uh, families seem to be more and more and more divided. Churches seem to be going towards more and more polarization. And, of course, the nation that we live in right now, it seems to be torn at the seams in the political divide. And you can almost size someone up by figuring out who they voted for, and you, you know everything about them at that point. And what this proverb is going to cleanse in us as people who want godly wisdom so that we wouldn't be devoid of understanding is to not 
point the finger at everyone else as the actual problem. Now, if it wasn't for that political problem, our country would be great. This political party is running it into the ground. Some of you right now are thinking, he's right. I don't know which party you're talking about, but you think I'm right. <laughs> if it wasn't for that neighborhood and the way that they just, they're, they're unruly and they're ungodly and they're just off the rails in this generation, my goodness. And I'll tell you, the real problem, when I get invited to Thanksgiving, is that guy. <laughs> and we all look out as a temptation that will turn into despising your neighbor. What is despising? What, what, what is the wisdom trying to prevent us from doing? Despising, in, in a view, is looking down on someone. This, when you despise your neighbor or your enemy or your wife, child, neighbor, friend, or family, you have, they have done something in your life that is so disgusting to you, because, of course, you would never do that, that you've lost respect for them and you're looking down on them. And it's a challenging thing that has to get worked out in our heart because it exaggerates the person and it exaggerates you. They, they struggle with a sin that you don't with so they're less than you and you're greater than them. It makes them small and it makes you great. Uh, maybe the best way to get this picture is uh, and we have this now in Boise, which I'm so excited about, because the more that Boise grows, the more we get things that real cities have. <laughs> we now have, I was actually walking down 8th Street with my wife last weekend, and we had an artist with her little easel up, and for a small price, she would draw a caricature of you. And that means, that's like a real city thing to do. <laughs> now, if you've never had that done to your face and your features, be warned <laughs> that character drawings are a, a dangerous game because the reason they're fun to look at is they take a feature that maybe you're trying to hide from someone because you don't love it about yourself, and it expands the feature to make it comical. So listen to the definition of caricature. I actually shared an example of it. I feel so bad for this kid, but I did. <laughs> Poor kid. Look at my wife showed me that, so that's her fault. <laughs> A picture description or imitation of a person in which a certain striking characteristics are exaggerated in order to create a comic or grotesque effect. So that poor kid has the, like a weird blonde Beatles mop top with gangly teeth and a shriveled up face in the center there. And look at him. He looks like a nice kid, but that's his characterization. And if it was a drawing of me, it would be like a receding hairline and bowed legs and a, and a, a weird flat face. And the reason it's worth sharing in a way that we can laugh at, because when we despise someone, when we point the finger at a group and say it's their fault, what we're actually doing is we're making a caricature of their character. We're, we're saying that it's my enemy's fault, and we start, rather than accentuating one of their physical features, we start accentuating one of their sinful features. We start taking something that they expose themselves at, and we can now see them as the sinner that they are, and we define them by it. And so you have to be careful with extreme, exaggerating type language. This is true in all of our relationships. Careful when you say things like, you always do this. That's a, one of the conversation stoppers in my household. Is like, wait, not always. Uh, you never help. That person is the worst gossip. They have such a problem with anger. They're the biggest cheater. And then you get to a place where you exaggerate your feelings towards them and you say, I can't even stand them. You can't stand them. You can't be in the same room as them. You can't look at them. You can't feast with them. You can't break bread with them. Because they have become a character of a sin that you hate. And most likely a sin that they struggle with that you don't happen to. So now you've put yourself in a position of moral superiority and you've exaggerated your goodness by exaggerating their unrighteousness. And that is foolishness. That is when you are devoid of understanding and wisdom. Uh, hopefully some of you, as we, as we think about this, will have a lens of the Sermon on the Mount at this moment. Because Jesus actually talks about this as a great danger in the way that relationships will break down between people. 
when he says, why do you try to take the speck out of your brother's eye and you've got a plank out of your own? Jesus is using exaggerating language, but he does it in the other way. Jesus says, what we should exaggerate or what should we, we should really allow to be accentuated is our own need for grace. And what should, we should see as a smaller problem is other people's need for grace. So that we don't try to blame our enemies or the groups that our enemies are a part of for all the problems of the world because it takes two sinners for every relationship to work and fail. So the first difficult truth that will not make this a popular sermon is that part one is that we have to look in the mirror. There are so many relationship breakdowns that exist in our morning of worship right now. And wisdom comes in and says, you know whose works you really can correct by the grace of God? You know whose ways you can present to God in an honoring way? You really don't have much control over your enemies. you got a lot of control over your own life. And that's why the proverb says that if you have understanding, you hold peace. Understanding is the plank in our eye. Understanding is our own need for grace. Understanding is the fact that just because we don't struggle with a particular sin doesn't mean that we don't struggle with sin. To be peacemakers, we have to look in the mirror. Okay, that's part one. Let's go to our next proverb to look for part two in a three-step program here for reconciling and peacemaking. Proverbs chapter 24. I think the Proverbs will get less popular as we go. Verse 28 of chapter 24. Do not be a witness against your neighbor without cause. For would you deceive with your lips? Do not say, I will do to him just as he has done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. This is for our friend Inigo Montoya. Uh, They slander me. They lied about me. Well, I can give a false witness about them. They hurt me, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We live in a time where there's a phrase that people use, I have all the receipts. This is a way of people reminding their enemies that we live in a time where it's very easy to pull up people's faults and their shortcomings and their failures. There's a worldwide record of everything we've done. And it'd be very tempting to see one person's failure or one person's transgression transgression against you as a receipt that you hold and a debt that they now owe. But the proverb writer says, you're not just holding receipts. You're actually holding a grudge. You're holding against them a debt that you are going to require them to pay that really has no form of payment. And so, as we think about this, we're going to add to the steps of peacemaking by saying, not only do you look in the mirror, but you also let go of the grudge. But before we move on, we have to say, well, how do you actually do that? What does it mean to let go of a grudge? Uh, Many of us have hurts and pains and transgressions that, that live in our hearts and they plague our mind. And we're on the right side of justice in the way that we hold on to the wrongs that have been done to us. So when the proverb writer says, don't try to keep an account of every wrong so that you can equally equal it back and repay it, well, what's the alternative? Let's look at the alternative in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 9. He who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. Okay, Um, disclaimers will be added to... uh, covering a matter. I think any time you walk down a road of forgiveness and reconciliation, and it includes the word like cover, you have to disclaim what that actually means. So hold on to that. There's a two-part proverb we're looking at here, and I want to start with the second part, because it says, he who repeats a matter separates friends. So let's look at the contrast of covering a matter first. This will give us some insight as to 
how we're actually holding on to grudges. It says when you repeat a matter, you're walking down the road of separation. You and a friend or a group of friends or you and someone else against a friend. But this is why it's so important for us to remember that when the, when the Proverbs try to spare us from foolish actions, it's not just trying to keep us from being the village idiot who makes a bunch of fumbling mistakes that could be kind of funny if you look at it through the light, right lens. Foolishness is destructive. If you have foolishness that defines relationships, it will end in destruction. It will end with the separation of friends. And it says when... Friends separate, what preceded was a repeating of the matter. What does he mean by repeating the matter? It's a couple different ways we could see this. One is exactly what we looked at at the previous proverb. You're literally repeating one for one. You hurt me, I hurt you. You, owe, you stole money from me, I'm going to steal money from you. You slander, you gossip, you lie, you're angry. Well, I will return all of that, repeating everything you do to me, right back to you. And if I'm good at it, I'll even be better at it. But there's another way to think about repeating a matter. Repeating a matter is also taking the actual transgression, whatever it was, and reliving it over and over and over again. So someone hurt you. Someone wronged you or transgressed against you. And you march right over to your mutual friends and you say, can you believe what this person did? And it becomes a definition of the friendship that once was is now marked by the scarlet letter of sin in the category of the transgression. You define that person by the transgression and every chance you get, you air it on the radio waves of that person. Or you go to the person themselves. You're still in contact with them. This is a little bit closer than just enemies. Maybe it's husband and wife, and we've all been in those scenarios where it's like, well, you know, ever since we've got married, I just remember on our honeymoon when you did that one thing to me, and I've never let it go, and you're going to hear about it every time something similar comes up. You repeat it over and over and over again. Your kid has an issue they're trying to work out, and you just rail them for the thing they keep failing at over and over and over again. And maybe the most dangerous way that we put transgression on repeat is the way that we allow it to plague our own minds. And we live in a time where people are defined by the way that they have been victimized. Someone hurt me, and now I identify as a hurt person in this way. And let me tell you all about my hurt and my pain and my struggle. And eventually you go down a road of destruction where friendships will end and people will separate and the divide is waiting for you when transgression is on repeat. So the proverb says cover it. Cover the transgression. Seek love. What does that mean? Anytime you talk about covering, I already said we will disclaim it by saying this does not anywhere in the text say cover up a transgression. So let me be very clear and over communicate a dangerous way that this could be applied by saying if someone has wronged you, never talk about it, find a smile, pretend it never happened, find the proverbial rug and put all of your emotions underneath it and move on and someday you'll be in heaven. That's not what we're talking about. Don't do that. In fact, to over communicate that, I will include a disclaimer verse that we covered when thinking through what wisdom does to our lives and our ability to speak truth to one another in friendship, look what it says in Proverbs chapter 27. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Meaning there are times where it is better to tell someone the real thing that's going on, a sin, a challenge, a conflict in the relationship, than hiding it and pretending it doesn't exist. The, the wounds of a friend are hard truths spoken in love that may be hurtful because they're true, but they lead to healing. So we have to be okay with conflict. We have to be able to okay with gentle rebuke of one another. We have to speak truth in love. We cannot pretend that relationships are perfect when they're not. But when a matter is forgiven, then it has to be moved on from. 
It says, if you seek love, you will cover. Let's think of the word cover in another way that we actually use it in our language, which is covering the check. It was actually at lunch earlier this week, or was at a dinner, uh, Danielle and I and a couple, and the, the check comes out. I had all intentions, and they, they just grabbed it first. You've all been there. And they, they took the debt that I owed for the meal my wife and I ate, and they said, this one is on us. And that's a beautiful moment. It's a picture of covering. We're going to cover you. It's a settling of the account. It is not to say, we're going to cover you. Run, after, run out of the restaurant as fast as we do, and we know the best hiding spots so they'll never find us, and we'll never have to wash dishes to pay this off. We're not just pretending the debt doesn't exist. They paid it. They covered it. And as good friends, after we moved on, they never brought it up again. <laughs> Could you imagine if someone decided to buy you a dinner, and then the next time they see you, then you're like, yeah, remember that dinner I bought you? Um, it was a little more expensive than I was thinking. <laughs> It'd be great if we could work out a plan, or you know, maybe you could buy me a dinner next time. Now, in jest, all those things are fine, but when you cover someone, you move on. And you also, again, not a popular moment in the word here, you also do pay some of the debt. To forgive someone is to take on some of the, the pain and the hurt that that transgression caused and say, I actually am going to take that. It, it, it sometimes feels good when you have an opportunity to get a person back through slander or talking bad about them. And when you hold your peace, when you decide to not take the opportunity to bring them down and repay them hurt for hurt, in some small way, you're covering an emotional hurt that could have been placed on them. You're saying, I'm going to seek love to this person, and love keeps no record of wrong, and love is long-suffering, and love is patient, and love is kind. So when the matter is settled, it's settled. That is how we begin to let go of a grudge, by not repeating it. How do you do it? Try it. All of us will have a lot of opportunities to practice this one uh, in the very near future. You will have someone in one of the categories al already discussed that you could potentially despise. Choose your least favorite politician or your least favorite pastor, your least favorite neighbor, or the friend, family member that has wronged you. And when that moment comes where you can give them a little bit of emotional pain, don't. Take the thought captive, bridle your tongue, and don't repeat the matter, and the grudge begins to loosen. And if you do that, you're walking in wisdom. You're avoiding the destruction of fools. Now, let's get to the least popular part now, if we can. So some of you are still here. Some of you have left, so I'm sorry. Um, hopefully you heard the part about looking in the mirror. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I was joking. <laughs> it's totally joking. <laughs> So part three, um, we're going to look at a proverb that I hope will, there's a little tension in all of our hearts right now because all of us are tempted at times to agree with everything so far, but leave it less than Christ-like. Because sometimes we can say, yeah, yeah, grudges are bad. So to bury the hatchet, you bury the person. You say, yes, fine, I'll never repeat the matter, I'll never talk about it again, as long as I never talk to them again. <laughs> so I'm fine, we're good, we'll just never talk again, the relationship is dead to me, and therefore I have no grudge. And the Bible doesn't let us off the hook for that. Because in a way, you actually are repaying them evil for evil still, because you're, in some small part of your heart, treating them as though they were dead. And so now, the final step to this is that not only do we look in the mirror, allow the grace of God to start with us, and not only do we let go of the grudge, but we also long for their good. It is not enough for us to just pretend they don't exist. Look what it says in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. 
Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Lest the Lord see it and it displeases him. And he turn away his wrath from him. If you rejoice at the failure of your enemies, you are still wishing them some sort of repayment for the pain they caused you. And again, it seems like this is so applicable to our times because we live in a world of the constant news feed. And for the most part, the news seems to mostly be gloom and doom except for one small exception, and that is when your enemy fails. That's the only good news we have. When your least favorite sports star or political figure or celebrity or pastor or church, when you get some bad news, it kind of feels good. And that's not wise. We are not supposed to actually be rooting on the failure of the people we disagree with. We're not supposed to rejoice in that. We come to practice rejoicing in the only way that it actually works, which is to aim all of our praise and all our rejoicing on God and his love and his victory. And that rejoicing will turn into joy. But if we aim our rejoicing at anything else, we are violating the design of God. We are not supposed to rejoice when bad people get bad news. We are supposed to proclaim good news to lost people. That is our role in the entire the reconciliation plan that God has for our world. And we don't just long for it. We actually take an active part in it. Look what it says in Proverbs chapter 25. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. We long for the good of our enemies, and we take active part in it. Remember, this category is even enemies, which means we long for the good of all of the relationship tensions that we experience. This is the beginning of healing is going from a heart that still lives in the hurt and the pain that longs for it to be equal to, to allowing God to shift our hearts towards longing once again for the relationship to be defined by love and hope in the other person's good. I've always loved uh, this quote by C.S. Lewis, but I find it so applicable here because how do you actually do that? How do you long for somebody's good when inside you're just churning and turning for the worry and the anxiety of even seeing them? Here's what Lewis says. Don't waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets of life. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love them. When you are praying for someone's forgiveness, you will presently begin to experience the forgiveness that will set you free from being haunted by the transgression over and over and over again. When you take an active role in someone else's good, you presently will find that you no longer feel violated by their success because you're part of it. And this is where, if you've made it this far, we cross the Jordan River of the sermon. It's like we listen to all of this, and at every point, at every step of the plan for a peacemaker, there's something that I said where you have every right to say, I don't know about that one. Starting with me when that person was so arrogant and rude and hurtful and painful and their words pierced, and I'm supposed to look at my own role? I say, let go of the grudge. And you're like, you don't understand the deep wound that I'm experiencing. This isn't a grudge. This is something that I'm scarred by. And we say, long for the good of someone that has hurt you? The, the question that should be stirring in your mind is, how do I actually do any of that? And this is where I am so grateful that we have come here in the name of Jesus this morning. 
We do not come here in the name of good philosophy or psychology or therapy or counseling. I think all of those things have some value in helping us find the hurt, dig around for the pain, even locate who it belongs to and who the problem started with. But to find the actual power to forgive even an enemy is an impossibility for every one of us. None of you should be receiving this like, okay, I'll add it to the list to do. I was going to run to Costco after, and then I'll forgive neighbors later or forgive enemies later. Every candidate who says, I'm running to heal the nation, will inevitably fail without the power to bring healing of forgiveness. And every person who leaves here clenching their fist a little bit harder to try to love better will inevitably fail one of these steps. Because every inch that we walk towards an actual road of reconciliation is exposing an absolute desperate need that we all have for what Paul called the power of the gospel to save. And wherever any one of these points offended you, we now apply the gospel to your life. And when we say, okay, we start by looking in the mirror. In the mirror, you will see a sinner that is saved by the only hope that you have for the free gift of grace. Every single one of us can look in the mirror and say, yes, in fact, the distance that I have with my creator is because of my sin, not his. And when we think about opening our hands to allow hurt to be healed and grudges to be let go of, we find a God who moved first. He didn't just open his hands. He sent his son to hang on a cross and scandalous. The word says, while you were still a sinner, there's, there's nothing that you did to come and meet God halfway. There's no part of the reconciliation that you took part in. He hung on the cross while you were dead in your sins, demonstrating his love for you, seeking love to cover you. And when you think about longing for good, the whole gospel is given to us with this powerful invitation that you are saved by grace, not by works. And then God puts you on this path of good works that he prepared for you beforehand, all so that you could have this life of purpose and, more, and life abundant. The whole thing is the gospel. The whole thing is God speaking and inviting you to receive it before you ever give it away. To lower yourself from moral superiority, you must be humbled by the chasm that exists between you and the holiness of God. To cover someone else's hurt by absorbing it in, in the cross that you've picked up, you yourself have to realize you have been covered by the perfect blood of Christ, the one who knew no sin. And to actually live for the good of a lost and dying world, you must believe in a God who is good. And so we end with maybe the most crystal picture now of the gospel with all of those things in mind, we receive it first once again. How quickly we can hear the gospel, receive it freely, go live it, and then put our hands around the necks of those who are, are in debt to us as though we haven't been forgiven at all. So let me share one final moment of the gospel for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now all things are of God. Those who commit their ways to the Lord, he'll take care of it. It all comes from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, making peace, playing the part of peacemaker, not imputing their trespasses to them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. This is the gospel. This is the reason that when we gather, we rejoice in him and his goodness. And it is the reason that when Jesus was sending his disciples to go make disciples, he reminded them that wherever you go, whoever you meet, 
anytime you gather, you've got to hold the bread and the blood. Hold it at the center. Hold it at the service in the very middle of it all. Because it is only the bread and the blood, his body and his blood given for us that we can rejoice in the presence of God and we can take part in the ministry of reconciliation. So we have to take it all the time. We have to consume it all of the time to be refreshed in our good standing with God and to remember that every relationship this side of heaven will need to be repaired. And so God is raising up an army of reconcilers, an army of peacemakers to go forth and make repairs. Love enemies until they're brothers and sisters in Christ. Bring people back to the place where God can cover all of us equally in the grace that we so desperately need. And in doing so, our ways will be honoring to him and he will make even our enemies to be at peace.